Good morning, everybody. My name is Kimberly Flowers, and I'm the Director of Global Food Security here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We are thrilled this morning to have a special event uh, with a wonderful high-level Brazilian delegation. And we want to especially thank first um, Johns Hopkins with the School of Advanced International Studies who helped us put this together. I'd like to especially thank Jess Fonzo. Say hi, Jess. <laughs> Jess is a professor of agriculture and also with the Bloomberg School. Um, I'd also like to thank Fernando. Where's Fernando? There you are. Fernando Barros is the executive manager of the Forum do Futuro, and that's how this all kind of came together, and we're, we're so pleased to have the group that we have today. Um, before I, I begin more with the opening remarks, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about my program and then introduce you to a new CSIS director here. Um, the global food security project that I manage, part of what we do is raise awareness on global food security issues. Um, especially usually how it relates back to international development or how it relates back to U.S. strategic interests. We do a lot of analysis and writing and events um, on how the U.S. government is investing its money, whether that's in foreign assistance programs or trade or elsewhere, to think about how we're tackling global food security challenges. Um, part of what we'll do, um, our peak of next year, we'll be writing um, a, I would say a policy framework or sort of a roadmap for the next administration, no matter who that is, of how the U.S. government can continue to be a leader in this area. So next I'd like to introduce you to Michael Matera. Michael is um, five weeks in to CSIS as the brand new um, America's director, and I'll let him introduce himself and tell you a little bit about his program. Michael? Great, thank you very much, Kimberly. Uh, thank you very much for having me here, for uh, inviting me to participate today. Um, as Kimberly said, I, I've been here just five weeks at CSIS. Um, I have a career mostly in the U.S. government. I've spent 25 years in the, the U.S. State Department, um, working about uh, eight years down, eight of my 25 years in South America, in Argentina, and also working as uh, the director of the Office of Brazil's Southern Cone here in Washington. So I've had quite a bit of uh, experience and exposure to Brazil, a country that I have great respect for and a country that, that really serves as a model for, for the world in, in so many different ways. Um, I've started here at the Americas program uh, with a, what we say in English, a clean slate. Um, uh, I have the, the luxury of being able to define the program that I'm going to be running here at, uh, at CSIS. Uh, and we cover the entire Western Hemisphere from Canada to Tierra del Fuego. Um, I'm in the process of putting together a team of, uh, of researchers, um, and we're going to be putting together a comprehensive program looking at, uh, looking at the countries of the region and some of the most important issues uh, in the region. Uh, Brazil is clearly going to be one of the priority uh, countries that, that we look at. Um, we're in the process of, of, of trying to get uh, a number of people involved uh, with us on Brazil. and. Um, Geraldo has already told me that uh, he would very much like to collaborate uh, from Embrapa. Um, uh, so we're, we're already, uh, this morning, uh, building some of that cooperation. Um, we're, we're also uh, looking very much at, at Canada, at Mexico, uh, Argentina, uh, given the fact that I've spent 12 of the last 15 years in Argentina is going to be another focus, uh, and then Colombia. And in terms of, of functional issues, we're going to be looking at, uh, at trade and development issues, at security and transnational issues, and, um, and the issue of political transition uh, in, in the Americas. Uh, Argentina has just gone through a, a very interesting transition. Uh, we're looking at Venezuela, which is, uh, in, in the minds of most people, at, at a point ready to collapse. Um, but we're, we're going to be looking at these transition issues also uh, in the Americas. Um, I think I'll leave my comments at that and, and, uh, and send it back to you, Kimberly. Great. Thank you, Michael. So this morning, we have some of the very top leaders in scientific research and food production from Brazil joining us. And we're going to center our conversation on the key agricultural challenges that Brazil's currently facing. So talking about the use of land, of water, and how to increase agricultural production while still being sustainable. And thinking about how do we do that? How do we scale up 
agriculture production with a growing population, with limited resources, and what can we really learn from, agri from Brazil's success, their agricultural boom, and, and potentially how they are going to be um, central in helping us feed the rest of the world. Um, as exciting as the changes in the current political crisis are right now in Brazil, as well as the upcoming Olympics, those are not necessarily our topics of today, so we're going to keep it on agriculture. We did have some last minute changes that you might have noticed. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Pianelli, um, the former World Food, Prizer, World Food Prize winner and president of the Forum de Futura, was unable to travel due to his health. and. Um, Mr. Lopez, the president of Improba, was unable to come because of some, some government changes, but we're very grateful to have some replacements um, in line with that. Um, I want to make sure that everybody has a translation device. If you don't, raise your hand. Um, there's only one channel. You just have to turn it on um, whenever we need it. Some of our speakers will be using translation this morning. Um, if you have any challenge with, challenges with that, let us know. Travis, in the purple shirt in the back, raise your hand, Travis. He's our very very competent AV person. So if we have any major problems with that, just raise your hand and, and we will get you some help. Um, you know, to start with, I, I'll be brief on this, but in reading up about Brazil, because it's not an area I know a lot about, my, my focus has been mostly in Africa and the Caribbean, but um, I, there was a great article in The Economist just last month, and I'm just going to read a portion of it. Probably everyone here knows most of this already about Brazil. But it talks about how the increase in Brazil's farm production has been absolutely stunning. From 1996 to 2006, the total value of the country's crops rose from 23 billion, well, 23 billion reais to 108 billion reais, but that's 365%. That's a phenomenal increase. And it's increased its, be its beef exports tenfold in a decade. It's now overtaken Australia as the world's largest exporter. It has the world's largest cattle herd after India's. It's also the world's largest exporter of poultry, sugarcane, and ethanol. Since 1990, its soybean output has risen from 15 tons to over 16 million tons. 15, yeah, did I say that right? 15 million tons to 16, 60 million tons. And Brazil now accounts for a third of the world's soybean exports, second only to America. And later on in the article, it talks about why is this successful. There's a lot of land there. They're doing very good with the irrigation and water. We have the top experts here to talk to us about that today. But it also says, if you want the primary reason in three words, they are improper. I keep saying that name wrong. <laughs> improper, improper, improper. And we here today have Mr. Geraldo Martha, who's the coordinator of improper for the USA. And he's going to give us uh, a few minutes of an overview about about Brazil and about its success. Mr. Martha. Thank you, Kimberly, Michael, for hosting this. And on behalf of Embrapa, on behalf of Embrapa's president, it's really nice to be here and share some numbers with you to share some figures about Brazilian agriculture. Uh, I think that perhaps one very starting point is to say that Brazil transformed its agriculture, you know. We moved it from a traditional agriculture up to the 70s to a, an agriculture highly based on science. And this transformation, of course, and Brapa played a role, but we have this huge, huge contribution from universities, from research organizations. So, Embrapa is important pretty much, but of course, there's not possible to do that alone. But what happened in this transformation is amazing because, you know, back in early 70s, the early 70s, around 75% of the Brazilian territory was still preserved. I'm not sure if all of you know, but Brazil is a very big country. Brazil is more or less of the size of continental U.S. Actually, Brazil is a little bit bigger than continental U.S. So when we are talking that in the 70s, 75% of the Brazilian territory was still preserved, this is still huge. Traditionally, you know, for centuries, what was the story of agriculture? Let's start, you know, uh, cutting trees down. Let's start cutting trees down, open space, and establish an agriculture. Of course, we need to have cropland to have agriculture. But was really a very bold decision to Brazil was to think a little bit different. In spite of having all this land with trees and things that we could move very fast, our agriculture frontier, we started investing in science. 
So the result is that in spite of Brazil being today an agricultural power, I'm not sure if everybody knows, but uh, the first agriculture trader in the world is the US and the second country is Brazil. If you put all the European uh, Union together, they will be the second. But if you consider only countries, we have Brazil just after the US as the first place. And the thing is, Brazil still has this huge agricultural power with 62% of its territory preserved. This is huge. Just to give you an example, uh, people are talking a lot of uh, cattle that are destroying everything. Uh, we run some very interesting analysis uh, targeting from 1950 to 2006. What happens is that in this period, in this almost six decades, Productivity explained 79% of the growth of beef production in Brazil, 79%. And the increase in pasture area explained less than 21%. This is huge. And because of this productivity gain, the land saving effect was also very, very big. How big? 525 million hectares. This is more or less the size of the European continent. So because of technological gains, because of incorporating science into the livestock sector in Brazil, the benefits size the size of the European continent. So this is pretty much important. Uh, regarding the future, of course, uh, a good story in the past is one very important thing, but this is no guarantee what we can do in the future. So let me tell what we can do in the future. Uh, if we take, say, a low productive pasture and use, for example, these integrated crop livestock systems, for each one of these low productive pasture put into these new systems, we can save, we can spare from cultivation five hectares. What I'm going to do with that five hectares? Whatever you want. If you want to plant corn, just do it. If you want to turn into conservation, into preservation, plant forest again, just do it. Is it possible? Is it feasible to produce, uh, say, more than one crop for a year? Actually, you can produce three crops a year. We are talking about some places in Brazil 365 days without irrigation. You can have a very short cycle of soybean. Following the harvest of soybean, you immediately plant corn with brachiaria. You know, here in temperate climate, we're talking that between one season and the next season generally take what? Eight months, nine months, something like that. In place such as Mato Grosso, it takes 10 minutes. You're harvesting soybean, and just behind you are planting corn with brachiaria pasture. And then you harvest the second crop in the season, that is corn, and you have established pasture. You can use this pasture, for example, for cattle feeding, or you can use this pasture, you know, as a huge soil cover for no-till planting. I'm not sure if you are aware, but Brazil has higher than 30 million hectares of no-till uh, planting. So, uh, as initial remarks, uh, that be my, wor my words, uh, some figures of Brazil, and for a start, we'll be there. Thank you so much, Mr. Martha. Next, we're going to turn to Mr. Duval Dardo. He's the vice director of the Agriculture School of the University of Sao Paulo, and he's really one of the primary leaders in Brazil on the water debate. Um, so we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. As full professor of crop science department and the vice dean of the Luiz de Queiroz College of Agriculture, University of Sao Paulo, the fifth best university in agriculture in the whole world by US News and World Report ranking, and member of the Forum of Future, my presentation has the purpose of presenting the first approach to planning uh, and expansion of irrigated agriculture in Brazil. 
to optimize natural resources, especially water, consider economic, social, and environmental issues. Please, next slide. The territorial analysis considers water requirement, water supply, infrastructure as electrical energy, preservation area, agricultural production dynamics, soil and landscape capability, available area, rural development, and irrigated and irrigable areas. Please, uh, next slide. The magnitude order of irrigated area is 6 million hectares. The magnitude order of potential area for agriculture is 350 million hectares. And the actual area is about 8, 8 million hectares, with soybean 32, corn 15, and sugarcane 9 million hectares. Brazil, as already my colleague said, has about 850 million hectares. Brazil is larger than the United States if you take off Alaska. <coughs> Please, the next slide. The main regions are south, east, and south, with 37 of total irrigated area where the main crops are rice and corn. Uh, please, the next slide. The maximum irrigated area is 75 million hectares, but the additional area with high soil and landscape capability is just 22 million hectares. Finally, this stat just showed us the magnitude order of areas for agriculture and preservation purposes. The next step must consist the database in the field in order to characterize the reality in appropriate scale to guide public intervention. Define, first, the need for management of the evolutionary processes for sustainable production and irrigation system. Second, the finance of necessary investments. Third, the adequacy of infrastructure. Fourth, the license of activities. Fifth, the guidance and advice of producers and investors. And finally, sixth, the mitigation of environmental impact and assessment of other productive externalities among or diffuse actions related to the Brazilian government. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. For those who just came in, make sure that um, you get a translation device. There's probably a better name for that. Um, for our next presenter, we will be using the translation device. So I go, there's probably a better word for this than translation device, but please go ahead and feel free to put it on. Our next speaker is Mr. Paulo Ramon. Good morning. I'd like to inform that the president of the Council of Forum do Futuro, former minister Alison Paulinelli, that was the leader of the beginning of what we call the tropical sustainable agriculture that was introduced by Embrapa. He's absent because he um, he's sick, unfortunately, and asked me to send you the message. I'd like to inform you that we have two former ministers and two foreign, former min, ambassador, ambassadors of Forum do Futuro. Ministro Ronaldo Sardenberg and Botafogo Gonçalves. That makes our forum stronger. One from science and technology and the other for trade and commerce. 
It's important to say that to understand these phases that we are stepping into as the new moment of the Brazilian agriculture in which we could actually be responsible for this new plan in agriculture, both quantitatively and qualitatively. 40 years ago, under the leadership of Minister Paulinelli, and it was a testimony of this process, as I was working with him in 74, and that was the beginning of Embrapa. Foram mandados inicialmente 1.530 eh, técnicos para estudar na, na ciência, né? quando o Brasil não conhecia a sua própria condição tropical. Começamos a plantar soja usando variedade americana. E aí iniciou-se o que hoje nós chamamos um salto, da condição em que as famílias gastavam entre... 40 e 48 por cento do, do, do seu orçamento para alimentação hoje são 14 por cento a 18 por cento nessa fase de crise aproximadamente isso significa democratização do acesso ao alimento pois bem o fórum e aqui buscando integrar como como foi o início é, a ciência natureza e desenvolvimento, e numa linguagem mais de comunicação, ciência, natureza e sociedade, busca estar devidamente integrado, ou, ou se esforçando para integrar de maneira permanente universidades, a Embrapa e estados federados, que nós temos representantes também aqui. Então, esse é um ponto é, fundamental. Daí... É a perspectiva de entender melhor a complexidade brasileira, inclusive cada um dos seus biomas, porque o Geraldo Marta falou um pouco aqui, e eu complemento dizendo, aquele Brasil grande e complexo, ele tem biomas, seis biomas muito diferenciados. Tem condições culturais, sociais e de infraestrutura muito diferenciadas. E aí a grande pergunta, e é importante estarmos aqui, é porque como será essa, esse novo salto, essa nova fase? Porque não basta ter ciência, tecnologia e inovação. Essa é a plataforma básica, sem ela não se chega a lugar nenhum. E acho que estamos muito bem posicionados, porque é, o Brasil detém a, a capacidade, como já demonstrado. Entretanto... Tem outros fatores, tem a compreensão do mundo que está no entorno, tem barreiras, tem é, as dificuldades institucionais, políticas, e orçamentárias, etc. Pois bem, isso é parte do que queremos compartilhar para ouvirmos é, dos, dos senhores e, e das senhoras. E quero fazer aqui... É, eu não trabalho exatamente com irrigação, trabalho com água em geral, fui o primeiro secretário nacional de recursos hídricos, e dizer que do lado do fórum tem uma proposta muito objetiva. Nós precisamos de ampliar a irrigação para reduzir o uso de áreas para a agricultura. Mas nós precisamos, além disso, é, tratar a questão da água no sentido mais amplo, inclusive para melhorar a resiliência dos processos produtivos numa quadra de eh, adversidades aleatórias advindas de mudança climática. Nós não, ninguém tem domínio disso. Então, como forma preventiva, nós pro, propomos, numa linha política, institucional e, digamos, estratégica, é que temos que cuidar, essa proposta que tentamos difundir no Brasil, mais da gestão da oferta de água, num país onde tem, exceto uma área do semiárido do Nordeste, tem uma abundância de chuvas. É acolher essa, essa água no solo, ou seja, integrar melhor a gestão para que ela sirva às, às suas várias funções, e não apenas usos, às suas funções ecológicas, etc., Portanto, essa é basicamente a, a minha mensagem para que nós possamos ter 
um novo momento, quem sabe discussões específicas e contribuição para os caminhos novos que o Brasil precisa seguir. Obrigado. Eu peço é, licença nesse momento para entregar a Mr. Kimberly um conjunto é, produzido por um dos parceiros do Fórum do Futuro, que é ligado ao Ministério de Ciência e Tecnologia, que se chama Centro Geral de Estudos Estratégicos, criado, aliás, pelo ministro Ronaldo Sandenberg, ao tempo que era ministro da Ciência e Tecnologia. É um conjunto que reuniu 120 cientistas estudando a condição do alimento no Brasil, é um estudo recente, que eu vou passar a mão dela. Dá licença. Thank you very much. Um, one of the first questions I would like to start with, you know, both uh, Mr. Martha as well as Mr. Romano talked a lot about the importance of science and how part of, part of the reason Brazil has been so successful is because of the investment in science, the reliance on science, as well as the partnerships with universities. So I'd like to start with, with Mr. Marta. Um, talk to me a little bit about what specific sciences you're talking about and what specifically are some of the new technologies or the technologies in general that you think have, have really helped propel Brazil to be the success story that it is today. Well, uh, thank you for, for the question. Uh, one thing that is amazing, you know, uh, we generally measure uh, the intensity of R&D uh, relative to the agricultural sector. So OECD says that perhaps we should have at least 2% of R&D to have, you know, uh, a possibility of growing fast in science because uh, we first need to generate science, the science then need to be translated, then it can be, you know, uh, offered to farmers, to extension services, and things like that. The thing is that when you have low-income countries, uh, that was the case of Brazil uh, four years ago, generally the investment is only 0.5%, 0.4%, 0.6% of the agriculture GDP. And this is what things started to change it in Brazil, you know, because in spite of our condition of low income condition in the 60s, in the 70s, we started investing over 1%, almost 1.5% 1 uh, in agriculture R&D. Uh, in the past decade, we are ranging between something 1.72%. Uh, of course, this is not bad, but uh, we realize that if we want to, to move to the next stage, uh, probably we are going to, to move much faster than that, perhaps 3% of the agricultural GDP, 3.5% of the agricultural GDP, to face this bunch of challenges that we have uh, ahead. Why is this so important? You know, uh, for you to have an idea, 68% of the Brazilian agricultural product is already depending on technology. Technology, what kind of technology? better uh, fertilizers, better seeds, and of course we have this huge part that is not, you know, uh, in, in terms of inputs, is how to do. This is the productivity part, the total factor productivity when we are talking about the product. Okay, 68% already depends on technology, and the future this will be much higher. And why will be much higher? Because we have other pressures over agriculture now. We don't need agriculture only, of course this is pretty much important, but we don't need agriculture only to produce food, to produce fibers. Now we, we want agriculture to engage us in a bioeconomy era. We want agriculture to make uh, diesel, to make ethanol, to make bioplastics. And also we have this opportunity in bioeconomy to make biofactories. For example, uh, one of our colleagues, one of bright minds in Embrapa, Elibio, he worked with peers here in the US, and this team, 
they change it, the soybean plant. So the soybean plant is now producing some compounds that can treat HIV. The same was made with tobacco. So this tobacco plant produced some compounds that can treat some forms of cancer. So this is what we are talking about. Agriculture is still our major pipeline. And of course, we have many challenges ahead. And we can continue to increase agricultural production in Brazil. For you to have an idea, we did some, some research last year. And the potential of Brazil today, we are around 200 million tons for major crops. We can go up in the next couple of decades to 400, 450 million tons of these major crops. We can do that. How this can be do? Well, as I said before, we can intensify pasture production. And by intensify pasture production, we can free up some land. And then we can use that land to plant crops. So this is the amazing thing, you know. In Brazil, we have the opportunity to continue increasing food production without the need to increase deforestation, at least not much. Uh, some of the technologies will be that. For example, uh, Paulo mentioned, uh, when we bring soybean in the 60s to Brazil, it could only be planted in the southern part of Brazil in, because we have a kind of subtropical, almost temperate uh, climate over there. What we did alone, of course not. With partnerships from Brazilian universities, from ARS, from uh, US universities, we changed the soybean plant. A plant that could only be planted in temperate climates, today we can plant in the equator line. So this is the thing we're talking about. We changed the plant, we get a better knowledge about the soils, about the production systems that could be implemented in the tropics. So I, I think this is the kind of thing we're talking about. Tropicalization of crops, of livestock, better production systems, uh, a huge conservation platform such as no till planting that we have today in Brazil, this kind of thing. Wonderful. Thank you. Mr. Gerardo, you talked a lot about water and irrigation. And as we know, water is a finite resource, and irrigation can be very expensive, and infrastructure can be very expensive. So my question to you is around money and partnerships. Um, talk to me a little bit about how both the public and the private side um, work together to finance infrastructure and irrigation. And also talk to me a little bit about how you, you talked about mitigation of environmental um, uh, repercussions but talk or risk but talk to me a little bit about how you manage the sustainability of such a finite resource that was two questions sorry <laughs> okay no problem uh, first of all the most important thing when we have this kind of survey we have to know uh, what we have in terms of natural resources for example just to uh, show the importance of water, the water itself can be 99% of the fresh matter of uh, any plant. And if you talk about dry matter, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen represent about 96% of the total uh, dry matter. Indirectly, uh, what is the most important uh, input for agriculture. In this case, in the second slide, I showed how we did that uh, survey. For example, in the first map, we made the demand map. We estimate uh, water requirement. It means the total evapotranspiration. But it also means, for example, the total input of water and nutrients to provide uh, productivity. Uh, we also have one map for preservation area. We applied the actual forest code in Brazil and we have we took off all preserved area, then we define where we can have agriculture and where we must have 
preservation area. Just to clarify, for example, erosion is a big problem in Brazil. For example, if you lose just one millimeter of soil, you can lose 10 tons of soil per hectare per year. In this case, it's related to many different things. For example, in this amount of soil, we have herbicide. Then we have uh, human health problems. We also have problems with availability of water because when there is erosion, we have problem with the river flux. Uh, about money, you asked it. Uh, we have in Brazil, in the state and the Brazilian government, money for uh, this kind of uh, survey for each state. Then, for each state, we can work in a lower scale. In this scale, we work with 2050, uh, one to, to uh, 2050. And, uh, for each state, in the federal level, high scale. In the state level, we can work uh, one to 40,000. And the money comes from the Brazilian government together with the state government. Then we can divide, we can define, we can characterize uh, soil fertility, soil landscaping, uh, drainage, uh, preservation areas, uh, irrigated area, irrigable area, uh, rural development, agricultural production dynamics, and infrastructure. Then the money comes from uh, state and federal government. Thank you. Um, Mr. Romano, I really liked your point when you talked about the potential reduction of how much a family spends on food from 40 to 14. That's very significant. You also talked a little bit about climate change, and I would like you to elaborate a little bit more on climate change and on what Brazil has seen as climate change impacts and what have you have done specifically in your strategy to address that. I'll start by saying that this is a challenge in all countries in the whole world. First of all, we need to know better about each situation. In the specific case of Brazil, the events, the, clima the climatic events are much more active. And we at the same time, we're trying to develop the science to understand these events. We also need to elaborate on the strategies and instruments and mechanisms to deal with them. And one other important thing is that Brazil has done and keep on doing international compromises in relation to climate change. And most importantly, and I may ask for Geraldo to talk about this a little bit more, until 2020, Brazil will reduce in 30% emissions in comparison to 2005. The Brazilian perception is that this compromises in which Brazil is entering, it's not only a talk, but also an active policy from the country. Over 
talking a little bit more about Imbrapa. The system of integrated production that is that integrates farming, livestock, and forests, and rotation of farming. This system is. The system has a great possibility to generate climatic resilience and to preserve the soil. Furthermore, I would like to say that one of the most important things is that institutions and government in Brazil are compromised with international developments and agricultural developments despite of economic challenges that we might be facing right now. We can before we could not measure how much we had improved, but with by developing measures by developing measures, we now can measure how much we have come forward in relation to the past. Activity, recover some degraded pastures, actually we are increasing soil organic matter. What is the importance of increasing soil organic matter? When we increase soil organic matter, this is equivalent to capture carbon from the atmosphere and stock it into the soil. So this is huge. So actually what we are doing when we are recovering, when we are increasing this pasture productivity, we are capturing, we are mitigating carbon from the atmosphere. But this is not the only important thing. By increasing soil organic matter, especially in tropical soils, we increase the water retention capacity, you know. We, we are able to hold more water in the soil. We are able also to retain, to, to keep more nutrients available to plants in soil. So by doing this, we are not only targeting mitigation, we are also targeting adaptation strategies. And one last point that is pretty much important about financing. Uh, the metrics OECD uses is the producer support estimate, is the size of incentives to agriculture. For you to have an idea, in the past 20, 20 and something years, the level of incentives to Brazilian agriculture is around one and a half, less than 2%. So when we are talking about technologies in Brazil, these technologies must pay because our farmers are pretty much exposed to markets. And this is an uh, amazing thing, you know, because we are being able to do all of that and farmers are finding their ways to, to have a, a good uh, cost-benefit ratio. So, the basic is this. Thank you. Michael, do you have some questions or comments? Yeah, no, I have a couple of questions. Um, no, your point, Carello, on the, on the fact that subsidies in Brazil are as low as they are is really a, a very important one. I think we have a lot to learn uh, in this country <laughs> uh, where we are quite dependent, uh, our agricultural sector, on, on subsidies from, from Washington. Um, again, I'd like to thank you all for, for, um, for telling us, sharing this story. The, the success story of, of Embrapa and Brazilian agriculture in general is truly remarkable. And I think it's, it's a story that, that many, many people know, but I don't think the story is, is as well known as it should be around the world. And um, 
I think Brazil needs to do a better job in in sharing this uh, in, in sharing this experience. Um, my question relates to what Embrapa has been doing um, in terms of, of already uh, transferring technology, doing technical cooperation uh, in other parts of Latin America and in Africa. Um, I understand that Embrapa does have uh, some outreach programs, some cooperation programs of that sort. Could you describe those for us? And, and a related question, what more can the international community, um, bilateral governments like ours, uh, the international financial institutions, the IDB, the World Bank, what more can the IFIs uh, do to, uh, to help Embrapa and, and the government of Brazil to, to share the story and to share the experience that, that it's had in transforming the, the agricultural sector in Brazil? Okay, thank you. Well, uh, Embrapa, is the research arm of the Brazilian Ministry of Agriculture. So our main mandate is to do research. But in spite of this, it's pretty much important, you know, to decodify, to translate this research is what we call uh, technology transfer. And what is pretty much different than extension service. Extension uh, picks up the already translated information and apply directly into farms. Well, anyway, we have uh, our main mandate is to do research, but we are also has this very important branch that is technology transfer, you know, m making available the information provided by research. Specifically in the case of Af Africa, we have some uh, initiatives that are uh, pretty remarkable. One initiative is to work together, you know, to strengthen uh, the research uh, initiatives in Africa. So Embrapa believes that one of the key things behind Brazilian agriculture was this in-house solution to generate uh, scientific knowledge, scientific uh, findings, to generate technologies. So, of course, technology transfer may solve the problem today, but what's going to, to happen in the, uh, 10 years or so? So one of the things we are doing uh, with Africa, and then we have some, some money, some funds coming from NIFADS, from the World Bank, is this marketplace, as we think, uh, as we call. Uh, what is this? Uh, Embrapa researchers work together, uh, they work together uh, with African researchers and then with small money for each project, but the idea is to prompt, you know, to have this culture of scientific uh, development to, to move forward research. Under the technology transfer more specific actions, we have some initiatives, for example, Embrapa uh, has developed some varieties of rice, of cotton, things like that. Uh, <coughs> due to, to this tropical environment, could those varieties also work well uh, in African continent or not? We are working with African partners to do that. We also have another uh, branch of action that will be a kind of tripartite uh, cooperation. For example, uh, if you go to the <laughs> Nakala corridor in Mozambique, uh, they have a kind of uh, savanna that is not that much different from Brazil. We have some different in soil mineralogy, in mineralogy and things like that, but it's more well uh, the same thing. So what we are doing, Embrapa is providing some uh, scientific technical skills. The Japanese government is providing some funds to make this uh, you know, happen in the very first moment. So we have this tripartite collaboration. It will be Japan, Brazil, and the Mozambique government. So, of course, uh, <laughs> we would like to do much more, and of course, uh, if we have some money, always helps. Uh, we need to reduce uh, the intensity of this South-South collaboration, not because we wanted to, but, uh, you know, uh, following uh, 2011, 2012, Brazil started uh, a very difficult economic phase, and of course, we need to, to, to cut off those programs. But uh, Embrapa is always open to, to hear some opportunities to, to collaborate and help not only African continent, but also Latin America continent. Uh, we've been doing some, some collaborative work with USAID here, and of course, we have some initiatives as well in technology transfer in Latin America. I would just like to inform that under the coordination of Fernando Barros, 
the general manager of Forum Brazil. We are we are initiating conversations about a book regarding the history of tropical agriculture, which should be released by the end of last year, by the end of next year. Great. Okay, um, we're going to turn to the audience now. We have a. We have a whole room of experts, really. That's the beauty of doing something like this at CSI. So there's a couple of people I'll call on first. Since we didn't do a big round of introduction because it takes too much time, um, if you do have a question or a comment, please be sure to say your name and your organization or what you do so we know who's speaking. I think we'll start with you. Go ahead. When I was a child, when it was close to 10 p.m., Okay, coming back to my story, when I was a kid, when it came close to 10 a.m., my mom would ask me to do what we called innovation in Brazil, which meant that I would prepare, prepare the beef that we would be eating during lunchtime. I like to tell this story very much because the Brazilian reality nowadays is completely different. In the last 25, 30 years, we stopped importing almost all the food that we would eat to become independent and self-supported in terms of food and agriculture. Now we only, we only export a small share of what we produce, not only grains, but also beef and also eucalypt. Just to quote an exam example from livestock, livestock is livestock is one of the activities that most contributed to the to, to the development of agriculture in Brazil. It sounds like a paradox, but if we compare our numbers in the last 30 years, we increased production of livestock. Mm -hmm. We now produce almost 10 million, ton, 10 ton, 10 million tons of livestock, beef, and we export only 20% of our production which makes us which makes us which makes us almost 30% which makes us reach almost 30% of global beef exports almost one third of all beef consumed in the world in the world is produced in brazil furthermore it is important to highlight that these that our beef has a lot of technology and is very sustainable. In today's Brazil reality, we utilize integrated systems of production which culminate in the integration between farming, livestock, and forest. And the combination of these three different systems, farming, livestock, and forest. Furthermore, it's common in our routine to use to you to to use uh, practices that discarbonize our productive uh, livestock, forest, and farming. Furthermore, 
practices that integrate farming, livestock, and forests are associating with good practices in production. We utilize not only grains, but also sugarcane and pasture. These integrated systems contribute for overall profitability of the producer. From brachiata pasture to eucalypt, we try to reduce carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Furthermore, it also contributes to the livestock production, which is the overall health and cleanliness of our beef. We produce livestock in a manner that is cost efficient and healthy. Which guarantees the low incidence of diseases related to beef consumption in Brazil, especially the Brazilian uh, the disease association with beef called Vaca Loca. Today, we have reached the point Today, we can produce beef that we can consider carbon neutral. And in its production system, we use the least possible amount of resources. We minimized we, might, we minimize resources use. We are evolving into initiatives, for example, the Mato Grosso do Sul state, in which, by the way, Dr. Renato Rescai, the Secretary for Technology in Mato Grosso do Sul is here with us. He coordinates the carbon neutral Mato Grosso do Sul state program. The state is gathering data of all its product production from f from grains to livestock and farming and forest. And preliminary data has showed that the production system in the Mato Grosso do Sul state contributes to the super avid of the discarbonization in our productive and to minimize greenhouse gases. Furthermore, we expect to, in a short space of time, make the Mato Grosso do Sul state a carbon neutral state. Furthermore, I would like to give Miss Kimberly with this book that deals with integrated systems of production in Brazil. you as possible. Um, I'm going to ask that you keep your comments and questions brief. Don't forget to introduce yourself. Jess, do you want to start us off? Okay, thank you, Kimberly. Um, my question is about China. Um, with China's uh, slowdown period and, and the economic uncertainties of China's economy, um, do the panelists have any perspective on how import demand coming from China will affect Brazil. 
Um, obviously, soybeans is a huge crop that China is very dependent on to feed their own cattle. But it'd be great to get a perspective on on what Brazil is doing with potentially a, the slowdown of, of China's economy and, their, and how that will shift demand and, and importation. Okay. Here to introduce yourself. Thank you. Yeah, good morning. Uh, I'm Antonio Boinain from the University of Campinas in Sao Paulo. Well, in fact, this is a, a very, very important question. First, I think the scenario we are working with is that uh, the slowdown in China's economic growth is only a slowdown, in the sense that China will continue for the next uh, uh, at least 10, 20 years to, to be dependent on huge food imports in Brazil can be there. Uh, second, <clears throat> we are aware that uh, probably the food price boom is over. It was mainly due to a structural uh, imbalance in the market with the uh, very, we should say, sudden entrance of, of China as a major play, but that the, the, the system has adjusted. Supply is now uh, adjusted to demand level, and more important, it can continue to grow to attend the, the, the expansion of demand. So, so we don't foresee uh, that uh, we will have uh, I mean, the long, uh, for many years, <clears throat> prices boom. Obviously, it can, prices will continue to, to, to go up and down according to, to market conditions, but not uh, six, seven, ten years of, uh, of boom. And that's, then it comes to our, uh, to our fragi fragility. What is the Brazilian fragility? Brazil agriculture, Brazilian agriculture is very efficient in farm, but it's very inefficient when you consider the whole system. And, and I think that many people has not taken this into consideration. We say very proud that Brazilian agriculture is very competitive because we don't have subsidies. But uh, that's not entirely true. That's only half true. And uh, I like to say that uh, half true is a completely lie. So, so we are not competitive. Our competitiveness uh, were built on a very exceptional market condition. And that market condition is over. We can be competitive if we first solve our infrastructure and logistic problem. That's a key point to, be, to keep our competitiveness within in the next few years when market will be, I mean, the, in reg operating uh, in lo lower prices. Second, we have to keep our innovation drive. That's very, very important. I am not worried about keeping the innovation drive because we have Embrapa, and as you have seen, it's a lot of capability. But I'm pretty much concerned with our capacity to solve in the near future the huge and very important uh, infrastructure and logistic deficiency that really is, uh, uh, can block the, the development of agriculture. It's complementing. I think uh, a couple of things that are pretty much important. Uh, the form of growth in China has changed it. It moved it from export, you know, to a more domestic driver, you know, increased domestic consumption. Uh, so uh, for some uh, things in Brazil, such as uh, aluminum, things like that, might be some impact because, you know, uh, if you uh, diminish the drive to exports, industry perhaps is not going to do that well, but service sector in China, they are still 
booming, you know. Uh, and this is pretty good news for the the food uh, part of the thing, you know. China is moving fast forward to a uh, upper middle uh, in income country, and when this happens, they want to consume more animal protein, more fruits, more vegetables. So, if we could move forward in the whole uh, agricultural value chain in Brazil, uh, I think we are going to do uh, pretty well. Um. We have Fernando, and then we'll go here, and then there, and then there. We'll start here. Fernando, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have a quick observation following what Mr. Banai said. Uh, the Forum for Futuro focuses a lot on the dialogue between food chain and society. And we might believe that that's where is located our main problem. Because uh, there is a huge, a huge uh, uh, Grand Canyon between what these men produce as scientists, uh, as decent citizens, working directly with the, the universal values we all share and the comprehension of, of society. Only 10% of Brazilian society is on the rural area. 90% is urban. And they are driven by new social media. That's not a Brazilian problem. That's a universal problem. You guys produce complexity uh, each day more. Each day is, is more difficult to understand what you say. And you don't care about language. You don't care about communication. You don't care about decodification of what you mean to society. So he claims about roads. How come a urban guy will vote for someone who will provide the political decision to make a road which is located 2,000, 3,000 kilometers away from his, his beach? So that's how to do it. We propose, first of all, this dialogue to be uh, uh, to go to a, to a channel of the values installed in urban uh, situations, like uh, impact on health, uh, sustainability, uh, uh, resilience. And they all are capable to talk this language, because that's what they do. Uh, we are trying to, to put up a, a site which would be the, in the information platform, the organization, the codification of the scientific information on food. We never talk about agriculture, but the whole system of food. Of food. And the third step is to, to get in, uh, in contact with the society. Uh, we hope to develop with, with CSIS and the other institutions here means to, to to profile, uh, profile, to, to deep this, this uh, necessity, which is a very big need of us. Good morning. I'm Antonio Oliveira from the Center for Strategic Studies and, and Management in Brazil. It's a Brazilian think tank uh, responsible for the first three books that you have uh, received. Uh, just complimenting. Uh, the point on communication, I think we should have learned uh, from the coal, American coal industry that can sell coal as something clean. So if you do this for food, I think we'll be, we'll be successful. But my, my, my question is actually direct to Kimberly and, and Michael, and is regarding the role of think tanks such, such ourselves in, in putting the world to work together towards a uh, a bioeconomy. I mean, uh, there is no doubt that individual countries cannot face the challenge of climate change, and also there is no doubt of the potential of agriculture, principally in reducing carbon emissions from crops production and cattle, as well as producing uh, biofuels. We tend to believe that in Brazil, that biofuels is one of the ways to mitigate principally for us that we can say that among the big, biggest countries in the world, we are the one that have the cleanest energy matrix. We are around 40% of the, 
of renewables in our energy fuel mix, while the rest of the world has an average of 14 percent. So could you uh, elaborate on the role of think tanks? Do you want to start? You want me to start? Okay. I've been here for one year instead of five weeks, so that makes me more of an expert. Um, I'll keep my answer short, but I'll talk to you afterwards in more depth. Um, I think, to me, the role of think tanks is, is changing the dialogue. So it's producing information, it's engaging in conversations so that you're reaching an audience that may not be reached otherwise. Um, here at CSI, as one of my key audiences, policymakers. So that means building relationships and having, whether it's private meetings or big public events or producing short commentaries or long technical reports around topics that are going to change the conversation. Um, things that by, because I am far from an expert in everything, making sure that I engage with experts who are experts in everything and then taking that conversation to the people that make the decisions. To me, that's what a think tank is about. Michael, do you have anything to add to that? No, Kim, Kimberly, I think you, you said it very well. Um, we need to, I mean, think tanks play a very important role in facilitating dialogue, convoking representatives from different sectors, from government, the experts, uh, from, um, uh, from business. Um, I've been at this now just five weeks, but uh, with my government experience, with my private sector experience, I feel that, that um, I'm going to be able to play a role in, in doing that, and I, I very much welcome uh, opportunities like this. I think it's, this has been a, a fantastic contribution to, to our understanding this Brazilian success story. And to the degree that we can cooperate in getting that story out, um, we as CSIS are uh, very, very anxious and, and willing to, to collaborate. Thank you. We Mike's not on. We'll do a little lightning round, which means keep your comments short. We'll start with you, sir, right here. I try to keep short, but uh, I can resist uh, the comments by, by Antonio. And let me give you an example of uh, the importance of uh, logistic infrastructure on the competitiveness discussion. Uh, last year, in, or maybe two years ago, in June, in Brazil's largest port, Santos, you had a line of trucks that exceeded five kilometers. The trucks were full with uh, soybeans, and it was taking four weeks to load the soybeans to China until a Chinese vice minister said, hey guys, we like your soybeans, price are good, we like Brazilians but we cannot wait for weeks. So the, the issue that Antonio is raising is, is quite, quite important and, and goes beyond agriculture. That has to do with the Brazilian competitiveness in general. Uh, my question was, is, is the following. I mean, in, in, in some economic um, theories, agriculture is seen as the low productivity sector that hinders growth and development. And, and, and from then on, you go into the discussion of industrialization and so on and so forth. Embrapa has changed this discussion. I mean, if you have gains in productivity, in research, in things like that, I mean, Embrapa really uh, at least open up a new discussion about uh, that issue. And part of the, of the impact of, of Embrapa is, is some original uh, initiative they had. For instance, in Brazil now we talk about science without borders. Actually, science without borders was invented by Embrapa to, to the extent that Embrapa was systematically sending abroad a huge number of, of, of civil servants to specialize at doctor, master level, and so on and so forth. So that, that was the beginning of the Embrapa. It didn't, didn't came out of nowhere. I mean, it, that's 20, 30 years of investing in research and development, so on and so forth. Embrapa introduced also something that's quite important, which is uh, the, the partnership with universities, which is not very frequent in Brazil. And, and just to finish this thing, I'm going just to ask you guys to tell us if you have been so successful with uh, the partnership with universities, 
What about the partnership with the private sector? How do you see that strategic area of, of IMRAP? Do you want to address that at all now or later? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, and I completely agree, you know, we changed this because agriculture is not a thing of, you know, of the past. Uh, we can have future in agriculture, especially with uh, we consider this bioeconomy thing. Uh, what changes is that uh, when we are increasing the incorporation of science into agriculture, actually we are demanding uh, goods and services from the cities. So this is the thing, you know. Uh, the ability of sector to prompt development depends on its ability to to. Uh, to, to bring other sectors with it. So this is the case. Uh, I would say, uh, of course, we still have a huge avenue to go, but if you look at the, the story of the development, uh, I mean, of the Cerrado region, this was really a, a truly public-private partnership. You know, Embrapa is generating, uh, say, the science, is generating the technologies, but who is really making this transformation is the private sector who are really the entrepreneurs are the farmers, the growers, the, the ranchers. Uh, because of this, I, I do think that we need to move much more forward, you know, but uh, I, I think we are in a, a kind of right uh, uh, path, you know, we need to, to give a step further. And of course, it's going to be more difficult each time, but uh, without the private sector. And just very quickly to finish, uh, we are investing today around 1.8% of the agriculture GDP and over 90% of this comes from the public sector. It's public uh, funds, you know, to research. When you move to the rich countries, to the OECD countries, they are investing a little bit over 3% of the agricultural GDP and half comes from the public sector and half comes from the private sector. My point is, uh, if we talk about public versus public research, we are not that bad. But if we are not being able to bring the private sector to do research, it will be pretty much difficult, you know, to face the challenges ahead. So mm -hmm. this is one of the big things. So not only think about public-private things, public-private partnerships to innovation, but also in this innovation process to have this private sector also involved in doing research. Thank you. We have a lot of hands and not as much time, so I'm going to go with you. Raise your hands earlier on the end here. Uh, good morning. My name's Bob Hoff. I'm a retired Foreign Service officer. This question, which really centers on uh, an example of Embrapa's uh, creativity and innovation, goes to Dr. Marta. In 2011, the national, Brazilian National Biosafety Commission approved a transgenic or a biotech black edible bean, which was developed entirely by Embrop. And the investment on this was incredibly low. Uh, Dr. Aragon said it was like $2 million over a period of 10 years or something like that. My understanding, and the black bean is something that's unusual because it was not a commodity that was going to benefit agribusiness, but something that was targeting small farmers who were experiencing tremendous crop losses from 40 to 100 percent because of a disease, I think golden mosaic virus. My understanding was that this event was after more field tests was going to be released for commercialization and it not only attracted interest within Brazil among small farmers, but there were other Latin American countries that were also interested in this because of its applications. What's the status of this being now? Uh, will it be commercialized anytime soon? It's about to be launched. It's about to be launched. Uh, and the thing is not that uh, cheap, you know. To, to, to develop a new trade, the estimated cost is a kind of $136 million. So it, it, it's, it's, really, it's really difficult, you know. Because of this, what we are trying to do, eventually not go uh, to the end, you know, uh, work uh, up to the proof of concept phase and then uh, other uh, private sectors, 
uh, companies, uh, the private sector companies, they can take this, uh, this new trade, this innovative trade, and each one could develop by themselves. But uh, specifically regarding uh, these beings, these transgenic beings, it should be able uh, to be launched anytime soon. Thank you. If I could just step in here for one second. Um, Bob did not identify himself. Um, Bob probably knows more about Brazilian agriculture than anyone in this country. Uh, he spent many years in Brazil, uh, most recently before retiring as the agricultural attache from uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Thanks for coming, Bob. I did identify myself with uh, Elcio Santana with Georgetown University. Thank you so much. Um, it always breaks my heart to end something on time when I can tell that we have like kind of just begun. Um, but unfortunately, we do have to end in time. What I will say is we have the room for a little while. So for those in particular who had questions who didn't get it answered, please continue to have the conversation. Come up and talk to the panelists. We will turn the microphones off, of course. But that doesn't mean you can't continue to build relationships and, and continue this dialogue. Thank you very much. Before we end, we just give a round of applause to our wonderful speakers from Brazil. No, 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 that was my uh, successor. His name is Clay Hamilton. Yeah, How are you? They built an arsenal.